All right, I'm seeing 10 a.m. Uh, I'm just going to turn my camera on and greet everyone and get us underway. Uh, so good morning, everyone. It's 10 a.m. and I know we'll have people join us as we go along, which is terrific. Um, my name is Jenny Heyman and I'm a program manager for eCampus Ontario and it's my great pleasure to partner with and work with the Open Education Fellows in Ontario. Uh, and we have three fellows with us this morning. We have Jessica O'Reilly, Laura Killam and Helen DeWard talking with us today and they have special guests as well and everyone will introduce themselves talking today about open educational practices so i'm super excited for this um, just a reminder kind of housekeeping we are recording this session um, so what you say in an audio way will be captured what happens in the chat is not captured uh, in the recording uh, and our presenters will uh, inform you and encourage you how to ask questions and how, as we go along um, so welcome everyone, it's really great to see you and I'm going to turn it over to uh, the OE Fellows team. Jess, we can't hear you for some reason. How's that? Am I back? Great. Uh, you're back. Thank you. All right. Let me repeat. I was just <laughs> seconding Jenny's, um, you know, welcome and good morning and lamenting that this is the last of the OE Fellows webinar series, but thankfully they live on in recorded form. So I encourage all of you to check out the, the webinars that came before this one and uh, also to find this particular webinar online if you'd like to share it out after the fact. So today we're talking about open education educational practices, uh, shorthand OEP. And as we planned the webinar, we quickly realized that the best way to start a conversation about OEP is to bring multiple voices and perspectives to the table. So the slide that you're looking at is actually a list of speakers in order, as well as our brief agenda. So I'll kick off the talk. My name is Jessica O'Reilly. I'm an instructional developer at Cambrian College's Teaching and Learning Innovation Hub. And I'm going to do my best to try to sit the conversation. Um, there's many different definitions and, and semantic conversations happening about these types of practices, but I'd like to start us from a common base so that we can uh, have an engaging conversation. But first, I'd like to invite all of my co-facilitators to introduce themselves. So why don't you take it away, Sarah? Hi, everyone. Um... <laughs> right now with the flu so i apologize if my voice is a bit off um i always have my camera on but i'm gonna leave it off today um i'm trying to spare the cambrian team with my germs anyhow um i'm sarah wendorf i'm instructional designer with cambrian college and uh i started there in uh, february so about nine months ago i guess i'm next uh hi this is uh this is marnie marnie seal I am the faculty librarian here at Cambrian, uh, and I've been here for about, uh, well, I'm going into my fourth year. So. Hi, I'm Helen Duard. I'm the uh, lone non-Cambrian participant in today's webinar. I work with uh, Lakehead, Aurelia, Lakehead uh, University in Aurelia as a uh, instructor with the Faculty of Education, and I'll focus today on the teaching component in OPEN. Hi, I'm Laura Killam. I work with the Cambrian folk down in the hub um, and I am their innovation champion. One of the things that I've been innovating with is uh, open assessment. So I get to talk about that to wrap up the webinar. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. So uh, to get us started, I threw three definitions on the screen and you can peruse them at your leisure. But my actual introduction to open education practice started with David Wiley and a blog post that he wrote about the traditional, what he calls disposable assignment. Um, so disposable assignments are those 
ass assessments that students submit, receive a grade on, um, maybe a little bit of feedback, and ultimately they, they take in that feedback or ignore it and toss it into the recycle bin, either digital or physical. And Wiley really articulated well the problem with this type of assessment strategy and really the disservice that we do to students when we ask them to uh, pour their heart, heart and soul into writing that will only be seen ultimately by one person, their course instructor. And as I read that blog, I felt frankly like disappointed in myself. I teach college level communications courses and um, I really did follow that traditional type approach. So David challenged me to think outside of that and to look for alternatives to those types of, of assignments. And he calls the, those alternatives renewable assignments. Assignments that invite students to become producers or co-producers of knowledge, to share that knowledge openly beyond the bounds of a particular course, a learning management system, and to add value to the world beyond a conversation that begins and ends with one instructor. So as I started to think about, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I heard someone almost interject. Um, and I should note as I launch into this conversation that please interrupt me at any point. Interrupt all of us. It's meant to be a conversation. So uh, either in the chat or with your mic, please do uh, feel free to, to interject at any time. So when I started reflecting on the ways that I could evolve my teaching practice within the context of my college level communications courses, I really struggled actually to, to imagine um, how I might go about doing this in a way that wouldn't get me in trouble institutionally, in a way that my students would um, understand and, and feel supported, not coerced. And so I started looking at these particular resources. Um, Catherine Cronin's work has been absolutely foundational to my understanding of OEP and really what OEP can allow in terms of student empowerment and engagement. Another vital resource that I would point you to is the, the recent uh, Open Pedagogy Notebook publication from Robin DeRosa and Rajiv Jangani because they actually showcase many different examples, classroom tested examples of this type of work. And then finally, I went back to Wiley and a recent publication that, uh, that he pushed out in reaction to um, some of the dialogue and debate surrounding what is OEP versus open pedagogy. And he felt that we needed a new, uh, clearer definition, particularly from a research context. And so he's coined the newish term OER enabled pedagogy and really focuses on uh, what open education resources and the 5R permission can enable when it comes to student assessment and course activities. So in the general chat uh, text box, I've included links to all three of these authors. And for me, it was so foundational. Um, and I hope that this might provide you with a little bit of holiday reading to get yourself situated in the context of all of these um, very important, overlapping, but some would argue quite distinct terms. So. Uh, I'll, I'll let you look at that at your, at your leisure. Finally, before I hand off, I wanted to point out a particular self-assessment tool. And this tool was introduced to me last spring at the Open Education Global Summit. It is intended as, as a research uh, data collection mechanism, but for me, it was so much more. And so we've actually designed the webinar to follow the four key areas that this particular diagnostic assessment tool highlights. So in terms of openness and practice, it designates activities related to content, design, assessment, and teaching on a spectrum of openness uh, that allows educators and practitioners, librarians, instructional designers, and others would benefit from the use of this tool as well, um, and really helped me, first of all, start to question and think critically about, well, why aren't I collaborating in certain areas? What's holding me back? Are these barriers perceptual or real? And if they're real, how can I go about um, 
trying to make change in a systemic way to enable these individual course activities. So we're going to talk about this tool a little bit more, but uh, I'll also, here, I'll just pause the share for a second. I'll link you to the tool itself because I think that it's a, a wonderful place to start. And I believe that Laura will actually be exploring the tool in more detail as well. All right, so again in the chat, I've shared a link to that particular resource. So rather than walking you through my self-assessment in that tool, I'm going to allow a few new voices to enter the conversation. So we'll be looking at content from an instructional design perspective, or sorry, yeah, design from an instructional design perspective, content from a curation perspective and bringing the library voice in. And then we'll look at how some educators have adjusted their teaching and assessment practice Practices on the spectrum of openness and wrap up with a nice dialogue about all four and just see where that's going to go. So take it away, instructional designer Sarah. Thank you, Jess. Um, thank you also for inviting me to speak to this. Uh, and my presentation is specifically going to be about my journey from an instructional designer um, an individual designer, sorry, uh, to a collaborative designer, and then finally to an open designer. Um, so to begin, uh, as an individual designer, I joined Cambrian about nine months ago. Um, I was new to the field of instructional design and higher education. And in my first few weeks at Cambrian, uh, Jessica invited me to join the open day planning group. So we've got the logo here on the screen and a lot of question marks around that <laughs> because for me when I first started I had no idea what what she was referring to by open or open day um, but I tagged along and I sat in listening intently. So around this time uh, Jess had also become an open fellow with eCampus Ontario and it had appeared to have changed her life. She was so moved by what she learned, she decided to dedicate much of her time to learning more about open. And at the same time, I had just met Laura Killam, and she was very interested in, I was, I'm sorry, I was very interested in her and Jess's conversations about uh, this amazing thing called open. So I just kept thinking to myself, I have to find out what this is. And I was still learning about instructional design, but I was also involved in this whole open thing and, and I, which seemed very interesting and I wanted to learn more about it. So through the planning for open day, I had learned more and more and this was all great, but I still had a lot of gaps in my knowledge about open. So when open day finally came, I was unable to attend in person, unfortunately, but I joined in virtually. I had helped plan this event, not really quite knowing the ins and outs yet. But luckily, Jess, Marnie, and Laura ensured that most of the sessions were recorded. So after we finished up our semester, I got to work editing the open day videos over the summer. Um, I was, and it was through watching these recordings that I had my very first aha moment. I had reached somewhat of a tipping point in my knowledge and understanding about open. The gaps were finally being filled, the questions were being answered, and I felt like I finally understood it, like I got it. And what seems to me now as a simple concept, I've also learned that there are still a lot of moving parts when it comes to open and it keeps changing as policies, governments, institutions, and educators learn more about open. So that basically sums up how I started as an individual designer. So the slide that you see on the screen now, um, it called it, it Makes Sense. So that around July 2018, as I was editing those videos in the summer, um, I started to become what I saw as a collaborative designer. So uh, knowing what I learned over the summer and through some additional research, I kind of began a process of self-discovery. So I found a practice which was open that aligned with my personal values of respect, teamwork, collaboration, quality, and integrity. And open to me means respect for the author, respect for the educator, and respect for the student. I also saw teamwork and collaboration in developing open educational resources and open educational practices. And it amazed me that so many people were behind this movement. Um, just looking on Twitter and, and joining different uh, communities and groups and on Slack, realizing that um, 
there, with all these people behind this movement, it just gave me hope that we could be a part of and be leaders in this better way of education. So in my role as instructional designer, I get the opportunity every day to work with staff and faculty from across the college. And these opportunities allow me to build relationships and trust through meeting their needs and the needs of their students. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Carol. So um, she's on the next slide. There she is. That's Carol's avatar. <laughs> so this slide is about transforming. So from July to September, um, this really was a transformational period for me as an instructional designer working in open. Um, and I want to thank Carol for this because Carol was one of the first faculty members that I met when I started working at Cambrian. Um, and we still continue to work together on a, on a regular basis. Um, but she approached me with a project. So she works in our academic upgrading program. So she has students from a variety of backgrounds. Um, they come to her uh, with a variety of different goals, different life paths. So um, her as a, as a faculty member, she has some challenges with teaching students in a, in a large group where each student is working on a different subject at a different level for a different purpose. So um, she approached me with the idea that we could do better and she wanted to provide a bit more um, instruction to some of those students who were especially struggling with um, math. So specifically, she was using an open textbook, uh, this one here that you see, Adult Literacy Fundamentals. She found it through uh, BC Campus or Open Educational uh, Resources. And uh, so specifically with the fractions unit, she wanted to start with in her textbook because a lot of students were having trouble. Hi, Sarah, we lost your audio for a moment. Hi, Sarah, we lost your audio for about 30 seconds or so. Oh. Sorry about that. No problem. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, whereabouts did we lose? About 30 seconds ago. Okay. So uh, talking about the textbook? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So her textbook. Um, so I'm working from Wi-Fi at home, so I hope it <laughs> doesn't cut out. Um, yeah, feel free to cut me off if if uh, if, if needed. So uh, her she chose this textbook because her students um, she was able to uh, lessen the cost for her students in the academic upgrading uh, program, and so she would be able to freely print and distribute worksheets and units as needed uh, based on the students' individual needs. So um, this project that she approached me for uh, really led me to become an open designer. So my third kind of transformation. So um, based on her needs, we collaborated on a series of modules that used the content from her open textbook, which we can use because it has a Creative Commons license. And here on the screen, you'll see H5P and explain everything. So those were the two uh, technologies that we used to transform the content from the textbook into a series of interactive online modules. So basically, Carol uh, used the Explain Everything app to create some videos, um, and, and it's kind of like a whiteboard app, so picture like you're in a classroom, um, you know, uh, using a whiteboard and drawing and animating, so that app allows you to do that. So once we have the video, we can then layer on the interactives using H5P. So we, we made an animated visual auditory and interactive experience for her students who required that one-to-one -one individual instruction. Um, so using a lot of the principles of universal design for learning. Um, so I created a series of uh, four screen capture videos that shows how to create specific question types in H5P interactive video. So through this experience, I was able to work with Carol and help her um, become more comfortable with the technology. So um, there's a little, uh, this, you'll see three examples of some of the videos uh, there on the screen times nine because she went and created several more videos after, uh, after we worked together on this project. 
So basically, I consider this to be my second aha moment where I learned a new term for what I was already doing and not realizing that this had a term for it in the open space, which was called remixing. So um, realizing that we were using an open textbook, changing the content into a different format and making it more personal and customizable to her students, um, I learned the new term remixing. And, uh, and that was, was a, a, an aha moment for me. So it just further reinforced for me the impact that this could have on education. What if we could remix other textbooks, books, content, websites, documents? Uh, what value could this bring to students and educators all around the world? So basically, to, to sum up my presentation, um, my journey as an instructional designer, along with this project with Carol, brought me from learning about open to learning how to use content from an open textbook to customizing content from an open textbook to remixing it and then sharing what we've learned. So on the next slide, um, this basically shows, oh yeah, sorry, this was open day, how that kind of gave me the idea. So next slide, okay. So here I know I'm, I'm out of time, but um, here's an example if you want to check it out. This, uh, this is a blog post for the 9x9x25 nine by nine by challenge. And uh, it shows one of those modules that Carol and I developed together and uh, a bit of a summary of what I spoke to today. Thanks so much, Sarah. I'm just trying to get... Uh that link in the chat. There we go. Oh, Laura beat me to it. Thanks, Laura. All right. So moving right along in our open education practice discussion from instructional design to content curation. Take it away, Marnie. All righty. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the 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 role of the librarian and the, and the curator role, um, which is something that I've kind of stumbled into <laughs> in this whole, uh, as we've entered into the open here at, at Cambrian. Um, and I, I think librarians are a natural fit for this curation sort of uh, role because we already act as the kind of the copyright guidance people on our campuses and in most, at most campuses anyway. Um, so I was getting a lot of requests about, uh, you know, can you tell me what this what this license means? I, I found something that has a Creative Commons license. Can you, uh, you know, tell me what what can I do with it? Um, I was getting a lot of these sorts of questions from faculty, and I was uh, excited to see that there was an interest in, uh, in in using open texts here already before we had even uh, kind of kind of done any any work uh, building up to that you know, the open day and everything that we that we had hosted. Um, and I was also working on as a committee member, the uh, College Libraries Ontario Learning Portal Toolkit for OER. Uh, the Learning Portal has a whole section for faculty uh, toolkits with a ton of great resources. Uh, and I was I was helping them out with with that piece as well for the OER toolkit. Um, so I think mostly Jess and I started having these conversations about you know, where, where is this going? Where can this go uh, on our campus? Um, and we kind of just started, I think, talking to more and more faculty about this, uh, you know, directly uh, one-to-one -one and build, building some hype <laughs> about, about open uh, on our campus. Um, and, and so now I find even before open day, and especially since after, after we held our, our open day event to really introduce it to our campus community, um, we've, we've really been having to triage these requests uh, between us, um, you know, where I'm taking care of some of the curation and, and then, you know, Jess and, and Sarah, they're taking care of some of the more instructional pieces. Um, so it's, it's been really interesting to see that, that evolve here on campus. Um, I'd say that, that part of uh, what I'm finding interesting now is this kind of uh, trying to balance between you know, wanting to do more, librarians always want to do more, they always want to help more. Um, but also teaching, maybe teaching faculty to, to do it on their own as well. You know, we teach students about, uh, you know, information literacy, we teach them about search strategies, how to do Boolean searching, all of that stuff. Um, so, 
you know, why, why don't we teach faculty as well, I think is kind of uh, what my next step is with, is with it, you know, because we can curate as librarians, we're, we're you know, expert searchers, we can curate, uh, but why not teach others to curate on their own? Uh, I think that's, that's kind of the next piece that I'm going to be working on here. And the OE Extend uh, modules that they had on this were really great. They had the, um, the curation modules. It reminded me just of, just like the kind of, um, uh, infolit training that we would that we would give to students and I saw that and thought gee we could really uh, maybe build this up a little here add in some of the more the copyright pieces there for faculty um, and teaching faculty you know not just to be curators or sorry to be true curators and not just aggregators is what I, what I meant to say there not just aggregators of links because I feel that's that's kind of part of what I'm doing now is aggregating these links to resources uh, but to be a true curator, we, we, need to, we need to pull together collections of relevant content, right? And, and kind of uh, teaching that piece to people as well. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of uh, where I am with it uh, in, our, in our practice here at, at Cambrian. Um, kind of in, in, in library land, I think there's a lot of frustration about uh, metadata with a lot of these open resources and and how there there isn't any kind of consistency there we were having to go to all these different uh, portals to find these pieces um, so I, I think that's going to be an, I, I'm hearing lots of librarians talk about that and I'm interested to see maybe what we uh, what we do there um, but um, basically yeah I think I think if you're if you're looking into open educational practices I guess uh, what I want to say here with my, my poster that I have on my slide is, uh, you know, don't forget to enlist your, uh, your radical militant librarian on campus. Uh, you know, librarians are, are great allies in the open uh, scheme of things because we see the need just as much as faculty do. Uh, you know, we're, we're frustrated with some of the same pieces, I think. We're frustrated with seeing students pay too much for textbooks when there's open uh, options available. Uh, you know, we see them in the library fighting over uh, reserved textbooks that they can only borrow for two hours or, you know, making photocopies and then we're worried about, you know, copyright implications there. Uh, and we're also frustrated about, you know, uh, pu publisher restrictions. We're frustrated about paywalls, um, you know, having to get these big deal subscription packages from the publishers uh, to get access to content. Um, there's also, you know, the big copyright review going on. Uh, federally right now here in Canada and, and we're trying to protect our, our fair dealing uh, rights there. Um, and I think librarians are also kind of very frustrated with, you know, all these proprietary systems and software that we're dealing with, uh, that we have to deal with to do some of our daily work. So um, we are definitely big open advocates. <laughs> as, a, as this goes on, I see more and more open options come available, not just for library work, but things that, that work uh, for teaching practices as well. Um, so, so yeah, I guess I'll just end with that. That was kind of my final thought is, is as you make your, your foray into the open, don't forget to, uh, to talk to your librarians about, uh, how to become a better curator. Thanks, Marnie. And I think um, we need to really give you credit for the empowerment that you've offered educators on campus who are taking steps into open, but who are scared to infringe on copyright, not quite sure if they understand fully the Creative Commons licensing structure. Uh, so that collaborative element between educators, librarians, instructional designers, I hope is coming out in this conversation about open educational practices. So now I will turn it over over to Helen, who will be speaking about uh, openness in her teaching practice. Thank you so much. And I will advocate for partnering with your librarian because you can't do open education, open teaching as an educator without that support. I come from a K-12 background. I'm, I'm fairly new to <clears throat> higher ed contexts, um, so I see I see, I see it from both camps. And teaching in the open shifts your role as an educator. So my role from a traditional teacher where every student was like a pea in a pod and I filled their minds with the content that I needed and then I measured using standard tests to make sure that they all met the, the expectations. And then I rejected the ones that didn't quite fit the mold 
and the little lowly pod that fell out of the uh, the uh, pod, or the, the lowly pea that falls out of the pod, I try and nudge them back in somehow. So open teaching, open instruction, um, shifts through these three levels of awareness. For me, uh, awareness came first, um, took a look at how, um, how this happens in, in a non-linear way. There's uh, a lot of iterations, it's a lot of trial and error, and it's not always logical where you end up. So shifting from my first year in higher ed, I was teaching with lectures, I was using PowerPoints. Um, today, a lot of instructors think of lecture capture, so just video me while I'm lecturing and that'll be my, my contribution to open. Um, using essays or quizzes or even exams as the, um, the measure of success for students. And now it's shifting my awareness to how can I better engage my students in the subject matter to make sure that they leave the course with skills and fluencies and knowledge to be um, capable and applicable to the world of work that they'll go into, whether it's academia or the workplace. So the transformational practices that happen um, shift student learning from passive to active, student-driven, inquiry-focused, um, interdisciplinary, collaborative. So they're constantly talking to each other or, or talking to other educators in the field, in my case. Constructive, um, they're, they're building knowledge from, from pockets of knowledge or packets of knowledge and uh, applying that to within the course, the learning management system, and outside to external locations and organizations, um, connecting through, you know, grassroots movements um, to other teachers who are in the field. They're my students are blogging, they're podcasting, they're creating videos, they're, they're building a professional network, um, they're building their, their persona in digital spaces. So those are all tasks that I ask them to do in this transformational space. And I'm shifting slowly to open teaching, where I understand that it's not just about the technologies that, that I think should drive the teaching, but it's how the technologies support the teaching that I want them to, to leave with. And picking where and when and how and with whom that the students will be teaching. So I consider the power stru structures, the authority, the resistance that some of the students have, the attitudes to knowledge, um, because everybody has a different belief of how, how students learn, um, and how to bring disparate voices into the classroom. So I will literally have teachers who are in the field do a 20 minute Google Hangout in my classroom so that students can hear from other voices besides my own. Um, I deconstruct and interrogate some of the binaries and beliefs and the content in very strategic ways and I, I scaffold that throughout the, the course. I understand that open is not alone. Uh, I need supporters like librarians, instructional designers, um, media experts to support the students in um, creating, engaging, sharing, participating. And my students create rich media and, and with a variety of mediums in, in a variety of purposes. So according to Catherine Cronin, it's um, open is negotiated, it balances private and public, it challenges traditional roles and expectations, and values social learning. And at the base of it all, you develop digital literacies. So this graphic comes from Bronwyn Hegarty's work. Um, Bronwyn's an educator in Australia, and she talks about open pedagogies. And pedagogies is, I believe, a subset of practices. And pedagogies, these pedagogies overlap. You're constantly ne negotiating between and among them. And you're um, sometimes spontaneous, sometimes um, reserved, sometimes it's talking, sometimes it's action, um, but it's always developing the individual 
human to human connection, um, a learner to teacher, learner to people in the outside world. Always looking for what's meaningful, purposeful. Uh, going back to what Jess said about you know the disposable assignments and making sure that what the students are sharing has value to them and to the 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 place and space in which they'll engage. So how do you become an open educator? Well, the same three. You start with an awareness. For my open practice and to fit the needs of my students, I looked for Canadian and Ontario um, materials. Uh, eCampus Ontario modules were, was one of the first pieces. Um, the OE Fellows was a piece. And then this book um, written by George Velasanos from Athabasca University is a free text and, and there's a, it's chock full of some good resources. And I'll mention one of them in two slides from now. But the next piece is transformational. And again, pick one, just pick one. If I'm gonna offer you one, I'm going to offer Catherine Cronin's OER18 keynote talk about becoming open learners and open educators as a good place to start. But there are lots of keynotes from different conference venues, and there are lots of webinars that will just you know, transform your thinking about what you should be doing as an open educator. And finally, just do it. So open teaching is pick something to do. And I'm going to suggest one chapter uh, written by um, Alec Kouros and Katya Hildebrandt from uh, um, Saskatchewan. And they go through a number of different tools and strategies and techniques in this one chapter. It gives you an opportunity to try a, a variety of tools, gives students an opportunity to try new tools to show what they know in your classroom. Um, give them an opportunity to pick from a number of different options. Like Twitter, for my classroom, Twitter is an option. They don't need to engage in Twitter. Blogging is not an option, but the blogging platform is an option. So there are choices and, and selections in there. And I'm going to put a plug in for the um, Ontario Extend modules as a place to pick one. Um, and the Extend MOOC that's starting up in January that uh, you can still sign up for and connect with Terry Green at eCampus Ontario if you're interested. So become an open educator. Start somewhere. Thanks so much, Helen. And I loved the distinction that you made between open educational practices and open pedagogy, which is one that I think we can unpack further uh, as we as we reach the end of this talk. But last but not least, we've got Laura Killam, who will be discussing open assessment practices. Take it away, Laura. Thank you, Jess. I was also going to put a plug in for the MOOC that's coming up. Um, that was uh, not not the MOOC, but Extend was my first introduction to Open, and it was a wonderful introduction. Um, <clears throat> when I logged in in preparation for this webinar to do the assessment, I discovered I'd already done it at some point, and <laughs> I was like, "Oh, right!" And I can't place exactly when I did it if it was partway through my open journey at around the same time as Jess or if it was during the first uh, iteration of Extend. And while I did start my journey as an educator, I think as more of a traditional person, this is what it looked like when I first, um, when I first took that assessment, which I, which I definitely recommend. I came into it thinking that as, you know, educators, we are typically viewed as the experts. So my rubrics were very much self-created, uh, oftentimes in collaboration, though, with people around me. And that might be in part because I teach in a collaborative nursing program. And collaboration is something that is just sort of inside that curriculum. Um, I was the type of educator who was open without knowing it because I would share anything that I was asked to share. And I also posted things online and shared them publicly through spaces such as YouTube. Um, but not as much as I'm doing now that I'm more aware of this open movement. When I was marking, however, um, it, unless it was built into the course with the peer assessment, uh, 
typically I would be viewed as the expert and I would assign grades to students and it would be like, you didn't do this, you know, sort of tough kind of thing. Um, I did, I did build peer assessment in sometimes, but not as much as I would now shift forward to uh, this semester and everything on the next slide has sort of changed. Um, so the first thing uh, that I would say sort of changed this term at the beginning of the term was rubric creation. And so if you follow me on Twitter, I've, I've blogged about it and I'll share, um, I'll share a link to that kind of stuff after. But um, I invited my students to help me actually create the rubrics. So I, I didn't tell them, but I had some ideas hidden and, and that, that advice came from Mel here in our hub, like don't give them a, a version of the rubric to start with because then they'll be like, you're the expert and they'll, and they'll trust your opinion and, th and they won't want to create too much. And so I kept that hidden and I said, all right, this is the assignment. What do we think should be the success criteria? And we used a rubric for rubrics um, to actually build out a rubric. Now this process took several weeks to do three rubrics for the beginning, beginning of the course, but it actually really helped to clarify what the assignment expectations were. <clears throat> Sorry, I think more so than doing any type of um, discussion around assignment expectations, because as the students were helping me to create the rubric, I was actually explaining and clarifying their misconceptions around what reasonable expectations would be. Um, one example is that uh, one of the assignments we were looking at doing was an ethics assignment and I wanted something really small as a reflection for them doing the, the TSIPS 2 um, certificate. And some of my students came up with some really big ideas and I was like, that does not sound reasonable for the course. And so we sort of, we, we really did truly co-create that. And then I was able to get some feedback from the people around me in the hub in terms of how to build in choices. And um, those choices uh, were things like students were invited to do a blog. They were invited to do essays. They were invited to create video. They were invited to, to show me that they have achieved the learning outcomes in the course through whatever means made the most sense for them. A lot of students chose blogging. Um, and so the next thing that I uh, took a look at was the, the sharing of the information. So students aren't in my course forced out into the open, but the majority of students chose to blog because it made sense. Um, I did invite some feedback from people outside of the classroom. Everything is linked to my website, which then automatically tweets out the students' work. I did have some feedback come to me through private messages, which then I passed on to the students, but I, I encouraged people to comment on their blogs. I think most of the commenting that happened was from other peers because we built into that first rubric that they would get participation um, credit for commenting on each other's blogs. The other interesting that happened was that I also reflected on my process through the course. So if you followed me on Twitter and, and you go to the blog, there's um, anything that's tagged as the course tag was actually also syndicated to my website. So students would see it if they logged on to the course website, which by the way was open, not inside of a learning management platform. And I didn't actually expect my students to read it, but they did. And so what happened was as we're negotiating our grades, they were coming in and they were talking about, oh, you know, I didn't realize this from your perspective. And so it was just an interesting layer of sharing that was added on there. Um, and then to the negotiated grading, which is the next point. Um, it was really sort of, it was a bit of a, I, I don't know if you want to call it experiment, but it was the first time I did it. And um, I think there's a lot of improvement that could happen from that process but students were able to engage in self-assessment at a fourth year level, they should have the skills to do that. And they did use feedback from multiple sources. The other really big thing that was different about this course is that I allowed students to resubmit their work. So as long as students were able to, um, you know, find the time or wanted to, they were able to improve their grade. Now, when I did this assessment that you see at the bottom here, I tried really hard to be really honest. And it turns out that these things that I was doing are very open in practice. And 
I did it because it made sense for the course, not necessarily because I was trying to force openness onto the situation. I think I would do most of this stuff again, but I think that moving forward, I, it's important to make careful decisions that make sense for the learning outcomes of your course in terms of how open things should or maybe shouldn't be for the learners. And I really think that allowing students choice is something that I would definitely do again instead of you know telling everybody that they have to do something in a particular way. Now, I'm just going to take a look at the chat because I sort of lost track of the chat as I was rambling a little bit about open assessment. But that's sort of a very brief overview of um, the experience. Syndication, yes, is a, is a very interesting thing that we're looking at doing more and more of here in our program. And it, get, it gives people um, a nice central place to look at other people's work. Okay, I see some people are handling the, the questions in the chat. So um, I guess I'll hand it back. Thanks very much, Laura. So I hope that this conversation has helped to situate um, you participants into this conversation about open education practices. I find that sometimes as, as open education generally reaches um, higher states of maturity and criticality, sometimes semantic conversations can feel a little bit alienating to those who are new to the concept and really just are looking or are hungry for a path forward and want to think about how they might start engaging in these practices. So I wanted and, and the group wanted this conversation to really focus on pragmatic examples of open activities in four key areas. Um, hopefully it, it's been uh, a good jumping off point for a, a discussion and conversation that we can have for the remaining uh, 15 minutes. So I'll, I'll hand it over to the group. Please chat or, or use your mic to pose any questions or make any comments that, that you'd like to share. So I just, I love formatting. So I'm gonna comment, someone was making a comment about formatting on um, in open spaces because maybe you can't do as much APA or something like that. So what I built into the rubric was that if you hand in an essay version of something, I'll look at the APA formatting differently than if it was on a blog because I recognize that that kind of stuff is uh, restrictive. I actually think that because of my reputation with APA, that might be a reason why a lot of students chose blogging because it, then adding pictures and stuff like that is weighted into their grade instead of having everything formatted 100% properly. And I'll just echo that the references question comes up with my students when they're blogging. Um, I do insist on APA for references on their blog sites mm -hmm. and links if there are links. So I in, encourage them to provide as many ways for people to check out the references and resources as possible. So, so more is better. Just to clarify, they do reference, it's just I don't make them do hanging indents and things like that that the blogs wouldn't allow. Hi, it's Jenny. I have a question for kind of for the group. Um, just because we've talked about this in other contexts and I think it's really great. Um, we talked about it at the recent OEO summit. Um, what are some very small things that you feel like educators can try in terms of uh, increasing their awareness or, or beginning to do open practice? Can I jump in? <laughs> that was kind of my table at, uh, at um, the OEO summit. So I think that this probably the, the first step would be carefully considering choices around things like the use of a textbook, making a really good friend with your librarian and looking at ways in your individual practice that you can decrease uh, cost and increase access for your students. Um, and then as you get more and more comfortable, you can explore other options. I think because of the table I was at at the OEO Summit, I think it's about people 
and finding one person to connect to. I think Cambrian is quite lucky because you've got a connected hub where people can go to. They know um, there may not be a hub in your on your campus or there may not be people you know to, to, to turn to. So that's when you turn to eCampus, find somebody, talk to somebody, um, and then experiment with somebody so that you've got almost like a, a buddy, a digi buddy to work through issues with. I, I don't want to talk too much, but there's also a really exciting conference coming up and eCampus Ontario has a very limited number of scholarships for people who don't tend to um, be able to access those. And it's got a really exciting lineup of, 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 of guest speakers. I'll, I'll throw the link in the chat here in a, in a second, but I would consider going to that critical digital pedagogy lab in um, March if you can make it. I think that would be a very good um, Introduction to different things that are very related. Great point, Laura. Uh, just here again. So in my uh, doctoral studies, we've been having conversations about the overlaps between open education practices, critical digital pedagogy, as well as hudagogy, which is a word I hate to say out loud because I usually stumble over it. So I'll give myself some brownie points there. Um, do, what do you see the overlap being between open practices and cryptid PEG? Is there something that you can you can kind of summarize for us? For me, I, I see definite connections between uh, learner empowerment, self-directedness, and also the criticality that comes with questioning our current ways of working, why we we teach in certain ways, and, and imagining the possibilities that uh, education technologies, things like the internet enable, uh, and rather than fearing change, embracing what the this new horizon can mean for us and our learners. Would anyone like to add to that? Hi there, it's Sarah. Um, I, I think the, for me, especially with open, the, the ability to customize and personalize the content to your specific context, to your specific students, to your course, to the time of the year, like there's, there's so much more that can be done in an open pedagogical sense using open resources that I don't think could ever have been done before without the ability to freely use resources um, in a more meaningful way. So I'm not sure if that <laughs> helps answer some of your questions, Jess, but uh, that, that's how I see open um, in, in that sense. Definitely, I think you make great points and and really critical digital pedagogy all all critical theory tends to premise itself on on empowerment mm -hmm. and um, emancipation right and I think for me even just considering these these small steps forward toward openness has been very emancipatory and I've learned that a lot of the ways that I'd been teaching designing curating um, were just sort of mindlessly falling into the state Status quo rather than questioning, well, what could I do? Um, why not try that? What's wrong with taking some risks? And I, I think that all four of you have done such a wonderful job of uh, sharing the, the small and very large risks that you've taken as, as you've progressed toward openness. There's no right or wrong way to engage in this. Um, there's no one true definition. And I think that that's okay because it, it gives us so much agency and, and voice um, to be able to mold this type of, of practice to, to suit our needs, our context, our ethos those as educators, designers, librarians, and, and practitioners. So uh, if there are no other questions, Jenny, would you like to, to say some final words um, before we wrap it up? Um, yes, Jess, I'd love to. Um, so thank you so much, uh, all of you today for your presentation, talking about open educational practices, um, sharing the small things. And, and uh, I'm reminded that, you know, that was Laura's great idea and leadership at the OEO Summit, which is super. <laughs>